Hey everybody, welcome back to a new video. Have you been pondering getting a mirrorless camera and wondering if the benefits of mirrorless have finally tipped the scales in their favor? Or are issues like battery life, price, and available lenses holding you back? In this video, I'm gonna walk you through all the advantages and disadvantages of mirrorless cameras and DSLRs and help you decide which is right for you. You'll want to stay to the end for my bonus tip where I tackle one of the most common issues around mirrorless and one that's very misunderstood. My name is Simon Dantremont and I'm a professional nature and wildlife photographer living in Eastern Canada. I make weekly videos giving you photo tips or taking you behind the scenes for nature photography. Subscribe if you want to see more. First off, I have to give you a quick warning about people who are pretending to be me in the comments below offering you prizes. These are scammers, don't engage them, keep reporting them as I am. So let's start off by understanding the difference between DSLRs and mirrorless cameras. DSLR stands for Digital Single Lens Reflex. These cameras have a mirror in front of the sensor and the mirror serves a couple of purposes. First, when you're not in the middle of taking a photo, the mirror is down in front of the sensor and is directing the light coming through your lens upward to what's called a pentaprism, which again directs the light into the viewfinder and your eye. As such, the image you see in the viewfinder is the real light and image your camera lens is looking at, so this is called an optical viewfinder. When you want to take a photo, you press the shutter button and the camera raises the mirror to expose the shutter in front of the sensor to light, and then the shutter goes up to reveal the sensor. As you can see, there are a lot of moving parts here. A mirrorless camera has a different setup. Rather than having an optical viewfinder, it has a small electronic display in the viewfinder which shows you what the sensor is seeing in real time, like a little TV. Given there's no need to send an optical image to the viewfinder, there's no need for the mirror assembly and the flipping up and down mechanism. The sensor and shutter is just exposed to the front of the camera where the lens is. So most mirrorless cameras just have a mechanical shutter in front of the sensor to help take an exposure. Some cameras are even being made without any shutter at all and just reads the information digitally, which we call an electronic shutter. By the way, a DSLR can almost act like a mirrorless camera when in live view. That's when the mirror is up and you're looking at the back LCD. Note though that the viewfinder doesn't work in this mode. So let's get into the differences between these cameras. And let's start off with something we've already looked at, the viewfinder. As we saw, a mirrorless camera has an electronic viewfinder. There are some advantages to this. First, the image shown in the viewfinder is adjusted to the exposure that your current settings will take. So if the photo is going to be too bright or too dark, you see this in real time, allowing you to adjust the exposure. You can even see a little histogram in the viewfinder and lots of other things can be shown, including zebras and the setting details. These are a huge benefit. If your photo is underexposed or overexposed, like in this example, the view from the viewfinder tells you and you can adjust the settings on your camera before hitting the shutter button. On a DSLR, the viewfinder doesn't show you what the exposure will look like. If your photo is going to be over or underexposed, you get some indication by using the light meter, but you don't know until after the photo is taken. You take a picture and either look at the back LCD or find out when you get home if the photo was properly exposed. On the downside of electronic viewfinders, or EVFs, some people don't like the look of an electronic viewfinder, especially the first mirrorless cameras that were on the market. The color balance may be a bit off compared to what your eye expects, and the resolution may be less than your optical viewfinder. There may also be blackouts when your camera is taking exposures. That being said, many of these issues are being tackled by camera manufacturers, and more recent models are looking more and more like optical viewfinders. The electronic viewfinder on my Canon R5, for example, can be set to a smoother setting. It looks natural and has little blackout. At first, I found that the color balance wasn't to my liking, even if it's adjustable. Now, I don't even notice. An extra note, on a DSLR, reviewing your images on the back LCD on a bright sunny day can be very difficult because the light washes out the LCD. On a mirrorless camera, you can also review your images by looking into the EVF, which is a very handy feature. One thing that mirrorless cameras are also bringing to the table are that higher shutter speeds can be achieved with no mirror box needing to be moved up and down with every exposure. 
As such, we're seeing mirrorless cameras with really high shutter speeds, which sometimes come with electronic shutter exposures of 30 or more photos per second. While not a huge benefit for a portrait or landscape photographer, for wildlife and sports, this is a great opportunity to catch just the perfect moment. Here's an example of 20 frames per second and the ability to catch just the perfect timing. Know though that electronic shutters can render fast moving subjects out of shape through an effect called rolling shutter, so it may not be appropriate for every use. Another advantage that mirrorless cameras are bringing to the table is silent shooting. That's because they don't need to be raising that mirror out of the way which contributes to some of the noise made by DSLRs when taking a photo. Combined with an electronic shutter to take an exposure, mirrorless cameras can operate completely silently. Weddings, chess matches, recitals, or any other venue where making clicking sounds would be out of place, silent shooting is a big plus. The ability to focus is one area that may have started as a disadvantage for mirrorless, but is transitioning into an advantage. That's because early mirrorless cameras were not always competing with DSLRs for focusability and speed. DSLRs had mastered the use of phase detect autofocus and were very reliable and quick, but the early use of contrast-based focus systems in mirrorless cameras hadn't yet been fine-tuned to the same ability. I had some friends add a mirrorless camera to their arsenal for wildlife only to leave it home and go out with the DSLRs as they couldn't focus on fast moving subjects. Some contrast based autofocus systems popular in mirrorless cameras also suffer from getting stuck on the background. When something shows up very close to you, the autofocus won't pull back because your subject is too out of focus. This has been an issue, but many of the newest mirrorless cameras have solved this. All this being said, newer high end mirrorless cameras are doing things that DSLRs couldn't do. One is eye detection that is often paired with mirrorless. The ability to find and lock onto the eye is a great benefit to wildlife, photographing pets, weddings, or for portrait photographers, where often getting the eye in focus is an important goal. Another variant of this is subject tracking, which works similarly, but is looking for moving subjects like cars, airplanes, or any other objects. One of the main benefits of eye and subject detection is that the whole or most of the sensor can be used for it, where DSLRs often have their focus points in the center of the frame. That means we no longer have to worry about focus and recompose, which is a technique used with DSLRs to put your subject on the edge of the frame. With mirrorless, just find your subject in the frame and place it anywhere to compose the shot and the focus will stay locked onto it. It only took me 10 minutes to find and use this advantage. In my first outing with a camera equipped with eye auto detect, I was only minutes into my hike when I came across a duck dunking its head and I knew it would stand up and shake off. I just got down low, focused and hit the shutter button as it all happened in a flash. The camera locked onto the eye, even if it was outside the range that my DSLR focus points would usually cover. My DSLR would have been focused on the wings rather than the head. In summary though, while top tier mirrorless are outperforming DSLRs with autofocus, this is not a universal win. The best DSLRs are still outperforming many of the entry level mirrorless cameras. The trend though is showing that mirrorless capabilities are improving all the time and will continue breaking new ground in autofocus capabilities. And some manufacturers seeing all the benefits are putting their top tier autofocus capabilities even into their base models. We've long had stabilization in lenses. This is a great feature, smoothing out camera movement and helping us get sharper photos with lower shutter speeds. Here's what my handheld 500 millimeter lens looks like with and without stabilization turned on. But this has now been added to the sensors of some mirrorless cameras and goes by the name IBIS, in body image stabilization. Here it is with the sensor stabilization turned off and now with it turned on. You can see how this is a great benefit for getting sharp photos and steady video footage. This is actually an additive benefit to the stabilization on the lens. So they work together. It can allow people to take ridiculously long exposures handheld like half a second or even a full second. This technology doesn't really work well with DSLRs because the mirror blocks the sensor where all this magic happens. As such, this is a mirrorless feature but not one offered on all models. Some of the base model mirrorless may not have it. Note that sensor stabilization mitigates camera movement, not subject movement. If your subject moves in the middle of your exposure and you don't have enough shutter speed to freeze it, your subject will be blurry in the photo. Now let's talk about lenses. This one is a mixed bag. The good news is that most DSLR lenses can be adapted to mirrorless and work quite well. An adapter is used to make up the space that the mirror assembly took and allows you to use your DSLR lenses on your mirrorless camera. 
That's what I'm doing with my big 500 millimeter f4 lens while I await the mirrorless equivalent to be released. And it works just great. The reason this is so important is you can transition your camera body to mirrorless and keep using your old DSLR lenses. You can transition to mirrorless lenses over time. And these adapters don't impact image quality. That's because all they are is a spacer to replace the depth that's in the mirror assembly a DSLR occupies with contacts for the electronics in your camera and your lens to be able to talk to each other. There's no glass in them. On the downside, there aren't as many lenses yet in the market for mirrorless systems. And the used lens market isn't as robust. Some lens options are very expensive and some manufacturers are not allowing third-party manufacturers like Sigma, Rokinon, or Tamron to make lenses for them. These are all issues, but at least using older DSLR lenses is a great mitigation for this. The issue of size of cameras is favoring mirrorless as the lack of a mirror assembly gives the manufacturers more choice in camera size. That being said, there's a trend not to make cameras too small and dainty. Some DSLR users like a robust feeling body even with mirrorless, we want a good grip and not have that little finger falling off the bottom of the camera. But for my part, while I like a nice size grip, the smaller form factor of my mirrorless feels good in the hand and lighter. Optical designers are also taking advantage of the lack of a mirror assembly. This allows them to place the lens closer to the sensor, adding some flexibility in design options. Here's my Canon R5 and a 16 millimeter f2.8 lens. This is a small great package for street photography, for example. And I promised you a bonus tip. One thing that concerns people getting into mirrorless is battery life. There's a valid reason for this. That's because the viewfinder is electronic, meaning there's some power needed to keep showing you what the camera is seeing. Some also have sensor stabilization, needing even more power. As such, some of the first mirrorless cameras to come out had battery life much less than comparable DSLRs. Some were downright bad. There's a standard battery life measure called a SEPA rating, Camera and Imaging Products Association. I actually don't give that much credence in real world use. It's designed to provide the worst case scenario under very controlled conditions. For example, the Canon R5 SEPA rating is 490 shots, but I'm getting 1500 to 2000 photos per battery, which is fine, likely because I shoot in bursts. But because people have heard about battery life issues, they're looking up the SEPA ratings for the first time and seeing ratings like four or 500 shots per battery and getting scared by it. But recent cameras are closing the gap. Battery life of mirrorless cameras is going up all the time. In some styles of photography that takes tons of exposures, mirrorless can come close to DSLRs because they don't need to use energy raising that mirror out of the way for every shot. My own personal experience for my style of photography is that I'm getting about five to 10% less battery life than my DSLR. So in the end, battery life may be worse than mirrorless cameras, but only use the SEPA ratings to compare cameras against each other, not comparing a SEPA rating of a mirrorless camera against your personal experience with your DSLR. Also, here are some quick tips to extend your battery life. Set your LCD and EVF to turn off after less time, maybe four seconds rather than eight. Turn your GPS, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth off off when you're not using them or enable the airplane mode if you have one. Have your camera go into sleep mode when not in use. And also, don't have your EVF and LCD at maximum brightness. So if you're considering switching to mirrorless, what do you need to think about? Make sure that you can adapt your DSLR lenses to your mirrorless if you plan on using them. Make sure that a little bit less battery life is okay or consider getting a battery grip if this is a critical issue. Be warned that the first time looking through an electronic viewfinder feels a bit weird, but will likely pass with time. And make sure the lenses you want in the future are both available and affordable. Note that switching to mirrorless won't make you a better photographer, per se. It won't get you out of bed at 2 a.m. to go out and get Milky Way photos, help you find better compositions, or make amazing action happen right in front of you. But it will send you home with more keepers, get you more properly exposed photos more often, won't disturb a silent hall for a recital, will deliver sharper images at low shutter speeds with IBIS, and give you a smaller form factor. If you found this video helpful, give it a like and YouTube will show it to even more people. Remember, the best camera for you is the one you have in your hands and use, and that the odds of seeing a bald eagle cruising through your living room is very, very low. Get out there and take some amazing photos. I know you can do it.